Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, David Rathman's work with watercolor and ink features masculine subjects like cars, sports, and cowboys. Evan Baden's Illuminati series captures a generation bathed in light from laptops and smartphones. And she has toured internationally for more than 25 years. Jazz vocalist Sharman Michelle performs. These artists and more now on Minnesota Original. I've always liked race cars, cowboys, the movies, sports, athletics, uniforms, insignia, album art, music, rock and roll, graphics. I think that's always been a part of my work, this kind of boyish thing. It was kind of the early themes of my work, drawing tanks and football players, and, and here you are 40 years later and you're still doing that. First and foremost, I'm a painter, and I'm, I look and have always looked back on painting, and it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of like you're in this vocation. There's a performative aspect to my work in the painting. It's actually in the painting process, but it's in the message, and there's a certain playfulness in the work. I have two bodies of work ongoing in my studio as we speak. One is for a show in Los Angeles upcoming, and also a show of new cowboy paintings for a Martin Weinstein Gallery. This is the largest piece I've ever done, a watercolor. It's watercolor and ink on paper. The last two summers I've gone and photographed uh, demolition derbies. I remember I shot this guy's truck one week last summer. I came back the next week and he'd literally, you know, redone the first half of it, chopped it up, the truck had crashed. So there was this Frankenstein aspect to how they work on these vehicles. The idea of chopping the painting, having the cut there is very much in reference to how the vehicles are cut, chopped, put back together from week to week. This was a painting within a painting. I usually lock down in a theme for a show, but this time I've allowed myself to just keep it open and all my cast of characters have kind of come into play here, the cowboys, the trucks, the rock and roll, things like that. So that's been exciting for me. So this body of work is going to be shown at Martin Weinstein Gallery in Minneapolis. These all have the text and the legends, which it's probably a little more than half of my work I'm, I'm actually writing in, into the work. And the words come from notebooks and lists that I've compiled and keep an ongoing thing. There are lines of dialogue, there are lyrics from songs, there are snippets of conversation. It's a love of wordplay, it's a love of writing, always loving books and writing and dialogue and conversation and music. This looks like a lot of movie dialogue to me here. Song lyrics. A lot of time nothing comes of it, but I keep this going, this is ongoing. I keep the, I mean, I'm constantly writing these things down in the notebook or something. After a while it felt really natural to me. It was kind of coming to me and it seemed very necessary, especially with the cowboy work. Equally as important as the drawing it was the text, was the piece of writing. For this show in Los Angeles, I was very intentional about getting my cast of characters into play in a different way. So I wanted to get the cowboys in, and I've done that in, in um, two pieces that are quite different than my other works as well. There's a different kind of frame of reference. It started as a really just an aesthetic experiment. If I could paint the bottle to my, you know, to a satisfaction, there it came out really nice. The, the masking and the, the the kind of the sense of fluidity in this and this figure kind of coming and going. Whiskey and cowboys, I mean. Can't go wrong there. Yeah. 
Source material um, comes from several different places. The, the, the cowboy stuff almost exclusively comes from freeze framing a, a DVD, taking a screenshot off the television. Maybe about half of the work now is uh, generated from my own photographs. Also using the photocopier is, is a, a tool in that way. Printmaking was the focus of my final two years of uh, art school and has been a very big part of my work. Sketching the transferring. Now I'm going to. The second stage is applying the masking fluid and the tape. Yeah, you're not really seeing anything, but it's a it's a rubber, basically a rubbery kind of fluid that um, dries on the paper and, and prevents uh, pigment from going into the paper. Watercolor and ink have always been just real natural. Natural mediums for me, um, preferred mediums for me. There's not a lot of strategy or theory when I start something. I just, it's a real kind of visceral reaction and I, I just start it and it could, it can very well end up a dead end. There's a wonderful thing with watercolor and ink where it's such an exciting experience to paint. It has to do with the water, the reaction on the paper, and you're watching as the ink comes down into the valleys of the paper and it dries and you shift it. So it's, it's very exciting as a painter because you have control, you have your certain amount of tricks. I think that's the, the real enjoyment of watercolor and the, and the, the distinctive nature of, of the medium as well. I've always felt like um, my work is not necessarily a, about me. It's about the subjects and the themes and the way that I'm painting them and the way that I'm presenting them. So I think it's kind of what I wanted all along, but it does seem to be happening where people have a, a interpretations of the work on their own. It, they have a personal response to the work. That's very exciting. That's rewarding as an artist. I think that my style has just really been very colorful and um, optimistic, you know, happy, happy wares. And I personally get a real kick out of it, but I think that it also um, is a true extension of my personality and wanting to be able to bring that sort of energy and excitement to, to other people. I do sweaters, and then um, in addition to that, there are leggings, there are bike shorts, um, mini skirts, dresses, scarves, hats, um, the whole gamut of you know predictable knit items and then less predictable. I've always loved clothing ever since I was a small child. Um, I went to school for fashion design at the University of Minnesota. Went into fashion design professionally after college and was actually introduced to knitwear through that job um, where I was designing men's sweaters for a period of time. So the knitting machine is a piece of equipment that is sort of a dying breed. It had its heyday, I think, in the 80s and early 90s as far as home domestic use went. And it's electronic, but that doesn't mean that it does anything for you. It's all very hands-on. Now we're gonna feed the Mylar design sheet into the knitting machine. It's gonna scan um, the card, and then the card is gonna tell the machine what to do. It's a cumbersome process to learn, but in some ways that makes it even more interesting to me to sort of be dabbling in this sort of older form of technology. All of my designs are original, and the one partnership that has taken place is the pattern collaboration with Eric Carlson. He is a visual artist and a graphic designer. It's 
So the machine has the capability to knit patterns that you can draw. So started by just getting some of these cards and really just going and doing a lot of drawing on them and testing and kind of seeing how these drawings then will like translate into into the physical knit. And then the repeating pattern is a uh, is another like you know pretty difficult aspect of, of doing this. So the beginning of the process one of us has an idea and it we put it down on paper on the pattern card, and then after doing a few trials, you know, to sort of get an idea of placement and size and repeat and all of those elements in actually making a textile design, we sort of move into color combinations. And this is something that is so much fun, but you can't count on anything ever working. The mother load. There's just all sorts of stuff down here. You don't even know what you're gonna find. This is crazy, I haven't looked at this stuff in so long. Winter in the Midwest is a really bleak experience at times. So the color aspect of it, in addition to you know producing items that are actually made for um, cold climates, the color is really something that um, is important. It makes it a lot more fun for me to make also. This was actually knit for um, a chihuahua. He had a very small turtleneck sweater that was matching to his his owner's sweater. This was the first like card reader <laughs> knit. It's like some swords. And that was the first time that we had used one of the pattern cards and just to see it coming to life was like, I don't know, I was really excited yeah. personally. There have been um, a lot of really exciting things that have happened in the last year. I was asked to go to Paris to show my work in a trade show. A few of the other things have just been receiving positive attention by um, different press avenues and print and on the web and I'm happy to be able to bring small bits of joy to people. I just can't even say how thrilling it is in a way to to be able to do this and how fortunate I really feel to have this opportunity right now. Hi there, uh, why don't you come on in and take a look at my space. This is my bedroom, but it's where I do most of my work um, and where I store all my work. All my work when it's not um, being shown in a gallery is always underneath the bed. So this is where my, this is where my work is stored when it's not showing. Um, it's kind of makeshift, but um, when you live in a small place and you don't have a studio, it's just kind of the way things have to be. I'd always been interested in how people interact with technology and the social aspects that I was interested in kind of coincided with these visual things that I was doing developed into this connection and isolation that technology brings us. So down here, this is kind of where I show my work when I, when I uh, have people over. So I kind of lay it out, pull this stuff out from underneath the bed. So this is my first body of work. Um, it was titled The Illuminati and it was my undergrad thesis work consists of 10 pieces. It's gotten around now, it's in a couple museum collections, and it's been published um, fairly thoroughly through Europe and some places in the US. Each piece is 30 by 40 inches, um, and it's face mounted uh, to a quarter inch plexiglass, piece of plexiglass. The, the initial reason they were mounted on plex was um, I had an old uh, first generation iPod, and it actually had a clear um, piece of maybe plexiglass, some sort of resin over the top of it. And since the subject matter was dealing with youth and technology, and technology is so glossy and, and kind of shiny and slippery and candy colored, um, I felt that the plex really kind of related to that. I never really had this experience when I was young inside this technology. But I think that not growing up with it in my hand all the time, um, I think it gave me a little bit of a perspective from the outside. On these long drives that I would take down um, through southern Minnesota, there were lots of uh, you know, farms that were just lit up, and usually I was driving in the late night, um, and there were kind of these little islands, these little pieces of light scattered throughout the countryside. I began to notice that same type of effect with people, the same way this, the light would reach out and kind of just touch the people that were so close to it, but that it, it never really extended beyond that. Well, they say you know it's progress. So 
of the Illuminati, the work is paradoxical in, in the fact that um, it kind of has this subject matter that's both connected and it's both isolated at the same time. The light that they're kind of bathed in, it kind of gives the viewer this impression that maybe they're gleaning something or that they're being, you know, I use the term illuminated, as in, you know, you're, you are receiving some sort of information, you're making some sort of connection that's not very tangible. And at the same time, it's such an isolating practice because it's something that really you have to do alone. Um, and you, then you interact with the screen alone. You don't interact with it with a group of people. You know, the images, both they have this beautiful light that makes you think that there's this, this grace to these devices. And at the same time, then you have this just, they're completely surrounded by this darkness and this cold isolation. I always want the viewer to leave thinking about something. And I'm, I want them to be thinking. That's, that's really the hope for any work that I make, is that the viewer takes something away from it. The viewer takes something with them um, from the experience that they have with your work. I could use a good friend. I am your friend. Our current production that we have up right now is called Meme. It is an original show that we as a company have created in response to an epidemic that was going on uh, in our communities and schools called bullying. So my work often incorporates the Hebrew alphabet. I really love finding connections between biology and DNA and also letters and words and, and incorporating meanings into my work. I'm Robin Stiller Awind and I'm a visual artist and I do letterpress printing primarily but I also do some book arts and installation and photography. So traditionally letterpress printing is is made to print in a linear form. I really see things either in a pattern or a circle or haphazard in a, in a way, a controlled chaos. And so I like to take the letters, the language, and, and really play with it. And, and those compositions play an important part in my work. I also don't use a lot of actual words in my pieces. And so I like to try to find ways to incorporate text but not have it say something very explicit. Reese, hi. Hello. Good morning. Do you want to come print with mommy for a little bit? So being a new mom definitely poses a lot of new challenges. One is um, not having the same kind of time that I used to before, um, which is why I now have a studio at home because the commute time is much shorter. This is Reese. Reese is just about six months old. She's learning how to letterpress print. I like to involve Reese whenever I can. And so today we'll probably be arranging some type and I'm gonna make a new art piece for her room. I am starting on a piece that in, is incorporating her first Hebrew name, Risa, and her middle name, Liat. And it'll incorporate an animal and has a couple colors and then eventually it will be in her room. These are all Hebrew letters and we have to find your name. Here's one letter. So we uh, recently built a letterpress studio in our basement and I have a tabletop clamshell press. It's very small but sweet. And I have several sets of Hebrew type, some lead and some wood, and other sets of type as well that I've accumulated. All right, are you ready for a break? All right, you wanna go run some errands with daddy? Let's go see what he's up to. So the Hebrew alphabet, I'm Jewish, so it's a part of my cultural identity. And just doing a lot of soul searching over the years and finding ways that I can see what composition sort of creates me as a being. And having my cultural identity come 
from the Jewish faith, I have been really interested in learning more, and through that I study the alphabet, Hebrew alphabet in terms of the language, and each letter stands for a, a lot of different things, so it can have a, a numerical value, and the shape of it has an irrelevance, and the positive and negative space that it makes on the paper is important, and so there's, there's a really important element to each letter, and so there's so much to learn. Well, I started out just using black about five, six years ago, and that was the color I was most comfortable with. Then I slowly started to branch out and started to bring in other colors. Um, and now I really love using every color. I try as much as I can to mix colors on the press. You know, I'll start, for instance, with a light color and then gradually add colors so that I can continue my print but not have to take the long break to, to clean the press. The reason that I have to make art is because it's like breathing for me in a way. Um, it's just something I have to do and it's not so much about the output for me as it is the actual process of setting the type and carrying on the history. I feel like I'm actually taking all the people that have worked with that type in the past and I can you know, in a way, like, feel their energy through the, the pieces. And so for me, it's really about the art making process. With nothing but you and me And a full moon above Twilight time I'm with the one I adore And I couldn't ask for more It could only be love The feeling I get when you enter the room Infatuation's got me by the heart
harmonies, a tune that fits perfectly to the beat of romance. Like a song, a rhythm we can't ignore, and I couldn't ask for more. It could only be love. The feeling I Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs>